Welcome to Crime on the Canals with me, your host. That's right, Elizabeth Earle. Welcome. In today's world of health and safety and making sure that workers are protected within their environment to a, to a certain extent in today's world, it comes no shock that these sort of things did not happen back in the day. And when I say back in the day, I specifically mean in 1874, the Tilbury. Without further ado, a leisurely trip along the Regent's Canal at Regent's Park ended in tragedy in October 1874. Today's health and safety regulations would never permit cargoes such as those found on the canal that day. The lethal combination involved, then seen as simply as goods, would be too risky in the 21st century. I told you. For years, gunpowder had been treated as ordinary merchandise. I mean, apart from November the 5th, but we're over Guy Fawkes, aren't we? No special precautions were taken to ensure it was stored or transported safely. Fires were permitted in the cabin. After all, the crew needed to keep warm and they were separated from the potentially explosive goods by nothing more than a wooden bulkhead. Even that would not be solid and have at least one ventilation hole. Smoking was discouraged rather than banned and other inflammable goods such as paraffin and benzoline were carried in the same hold. What could go wrong? Remember, this is aboard a powerful vessel, one working hard to convey its load as quickly and efficiently as possible. This is a vessel running under steam power, with the steam of smoke and sparks spewing forth from the funnel as it forges ahead through crowded waters in densely populated districts. I mean, if you, if you see in Birmingham. This is an accident just waiting to happen. Tell me more, babes. On the fateful day in question, Tilbury had been carrying a full load. Among the less volatile goods were a number of casks of benzoline spirit. I hope I'm saying that right. Benzoline? Benzoline? Mm -hmm. And no less than five and a half tons of gunpowder. A protective tarpaulin covered the hold, tied securely on either side. At the subsequent investigation, both Mr. Keats and Professor Taylor pointed to benzoline as a volatile liquid at normal temperatures. It evaporates readily, thus under the top of a cloud of vapour was readily mixing with oxygen and required little to ignite it. In the vessel's cabin was a naked flame, be it the fire or a lamp. As the mixture found its way through the ventilation grill into the cabin, it effectively became an invisible fuse between the flame and the gunpowder. Men on other boats reported a bright flash, one being of a blue busticle, and shouted out a warning to slacken off and hold. Nothing ensued, so they waved Tilbury on. It was at that point the vessel Exploded. <laughs> Everyone on board died. What do you expect? In typical Victorian fashion, Government Inspector of Gunpowder Works, Major Manjandi, I hope that's how you pronounce it, recreated the explosion for the subsequent investigation. Scaled down to four feet in length, with the torch top only represented by tin, for the demonstration, it enabled him to show a cork in the benzoline cast did not prevent evaporation. With a candle providing the naked flame, it took 10 minutes to explode. I mean, 10 minutes is a, it's a long time for some men. But explode it did. Benzoline is a fuel once used in lamps burning a flame. The very properties that made it so useful in a lamp proves so dangerous as part of a cargo. The Grand Junction Company was severely rebuked for gross carelessness. Naughty boys. 
Parliament was also censured for failing to address the current unsatisfactory and inadequate legislation in the transportation of dangerous materials. Considering how little attention had been paid to ensuring safe transportation, the report did commend the employees and managers for the precautions they took without being required to do so by law. <laughs> by the time the report was ensued, Gunpowder had ceased to be transported by the company, even though a government inspector had pointed to the many times dangerous goods had been transported without incident. Since the accident, 75 vessels had carried cargoes of naphtha, gunpowder, paraffin and benzoline, a total of 133 tonnes of gunpowder, including the, a single consignment consignment of nine tons had been carried over the three months since the destruction of the Tilbury. This represented a similar amount to that carried in the preceding three months. Indeed, there was but one difference. The dangerous loads were now charged at twice that was paid previously. Perhaps the worst crime had been ignoring the report a decade earlier when the same suggestions to the government of the day had come following the explosion of 1864 and again in 1865 by Lieutenant Colonel Boxer. Same recommendations of increased safety had been repeated over three years to successive governments, yet it took the loss of three lives before there had been any action. It shows that some things just don't change, babes. It's money over matter for some people, rich people, government. So that is the tale of 1874, the Tilbury. I guess we all had to start somewhere. I mean, in the beginning, health and safety wasn't really a, a thought in people's mind until there were consequences. So did they put up the, the barriers and the protections to protect them from being sued? Or charged or did they put them up to protect the actual workers on board you can see examples uh, examples of this happening in factories in cotton um, manufacturers did extra protections for the people come up because they cared about their workers or did it come up because they didn't want to get fined by the government or authorities who knows hope you've enjoyed that mini story stay tuned Follow, like, share, subscribe, tell your mum, tell your nan, have a cup of tea, don't tell anyone at all, but I'm here for the next one, all the best.